Welcome to a Rice University Digital Media Production. For more information about us, please visit our website at www.rice.edu. Thank you all for coming. This is the last in our year-long series of five-minute talks on the power of ideas. And uh, there seems to be a general feeling that this is a good format. It's a really interesting format. It is also a challenging format for our speakers. Let me introduce myself. I'm Susan McIntosh, the director of Ciencia. And uh, our four speakers today are the last in a distinguished group that has spoken throughout the year. And if you missed any of those, you can catch them on our website, ciencia.rice.edu. Uh, and uh, so many of the talks have been just so extraordinary. So we're looking forward to this last set. Uh, we are very brief here. We are anxious to see how our speakers meet the challenge of developing an idea in only five minutes. Uh, our first speaker will be Devika Subramanian, professor in computer science and electrical and computer engineering, speaking on computational thinking. Good afternoon. I'm a computer scientist, and I think we're living in a golden era for my field. The use of computation has pervaded every aspect of human endeavor. Com computation has had a revolutionary impact on the way we live and the way we retrieve and process information to make decisions. Indeed, it's hard to imagine how we ever got anything done before 2000 without Google, Facebook, and high-speed internet. You might think that the phenomenal growth in computational tools and devices, the iPhone, the iPod, the iPad, and their adoption in our everyday lives would lead to an influx of undergraduate students clamoring to major in computer science. Alas, that has not been the case. Indeed, between 2004 and 2007, enrollments in the introductory courses in computer science at Rice, as well as the number of majors plummeted, with 2008 being an all-time low. That year, even closer to home for me, I could not get the slightest bit of interest in computer science from my then 11-year-old daughter. As she jauntily put it, she didn't care to be taught by someone who could not even pass her fifth grade computer class. The passing bar was the typing speed of a certain number of words per minute. That was a low moment for me, to say the least. My reaction, to quote, well, the philosopher Daffy Duck, what a revolting development this is. Is a computer scientist just a typist or a coder? Is a biologist just a pipetter? Is a chalk artist just a crayon pusher? Outrageous. I had to explain to my 11-year-old and to members of her generation who we are and what we do. I was inspired by the Disney movie Ratatouille, released in 2007, one of my favorite movies of all time. The hero is a tiny rat named Remy, who's a genius recipe designer, whose dream is to be a star chef in a Michelin restaurant. Remy's obvious physical challenges appear to be an insurmountable obstacle to achieving his dream. He teams up with a gangly garbage boy named Linguini in the kitchen of a famous Parisian chef. Hiding under Linguini's cap, he translates his amazingly creative recipes into step-by-step -step instructions for the unimaginative but physically robust Linguini to execute. And soon, the duo of Remy and Linguini become the toast of Paris. In 1998, two Remy's named Bryn and Page devised an exceedingly clever recipe to organize the billions of documents on the World Wide Web. They recruited a silicon linguini to execute their recipe, and voila, the search engine Google was born. This is the essence of computational thinking. Computational thinkers find a need, a problem to solve, and then devise a creative recipe or algorithm for the problem. By coding their recipes using their engineering skills and outsourcing the actual execution of the recipe to a tireless and reliable silicon beast, computational thinking Remy's with their computer linguinis extend creative problem solving to realms they could never have scaled on their own. So, how did I translate this vision into a foundational course for computer science? I confess I was motivated by my daughter's generation in this endeavor. My goal was to transform her generation of avid consumers of the products of computational thinking to inspired innovators and creators. With generous seed funding from Microsoft Corporation and with the intellectual and moral support of my program manager, John Nordlinger of Microsoft, I developed Comp 140, 
computational thinking, a freshman course open to all Rice students. The first version of the course was fielded in fall 2008. It's a modular course organized around seven major problems. It emphasizes conceptualization and algorithmic thinking and teaches students how to mathematically model, decompose, and solve problems of scale. Problems are drawn from all contexts. Here are examples. How can you determine your social standing in your college from the Rice Facebook network? How can you train a machine to recognize handwritten letters and digits? Can a network analysis of Enron's email corpus reveal the culprits who are ultimately charged? Can you write a recipe to create a new Stephen Colbert style routine, a sonata in the style of Mozart, or a novel a la Brett Easton Ellis? How does Google Maps find routes between places in a US map? Can you devise a better recipe for route finding? How can you detect if electronically recorded votes in an online election are tampered with? Each module introduces an interesting problem. All the mathematics needed to model the problem is taught, and students create recipes to solve the problem. They code their recipes in the Python programming language and can experience the joy of creating computational artifacts that can solve large-scale problems powered by their imaginative recipes. Students learn discrete mathematical models such as graph theory, Markov models, probabilistic reasoning, discrete dynamical systems, cryptography, and of course, enough Python to code up their ideas to solve these problems. The class started in fall 2008 with a modest 40 students, and in fall 2011, it mushroomed to 120. The course size was capped at 120 thereafter. I'm very proud of the fact that in each of the five years I've taught the class, 38% of my students have been women. Not surprisingly, the top students in my course come from every school in our university, architecture, music, sociology, engineering. Our major count now stands at an amazing 120, the highest we've seen since the mid-90s. We often draw a distorted distinction between science and engineering-minded individuals and the seemingly more creative types. I hope I have convinced you that computational thinking is indeed an innovative and artistic process. Computational thinkers equipped with programming skills can realize their creative vision and fashion new tools, new apps, new companies. Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, the Google self-driving car, Roomba are all products of computational thinking, and they're only a decade or less old. Few disciplines can turn ideas into realities so quickly. Few have such a direct and positive impact on people's everyday lives. Computational thinking gives everyone the power to build something out of almost nothing and to distribute it quickly all over the world. It's the 21st century medium for creativity. All you need is a laptop and a dream, and you can change the world. That's the promise of computational thinking and the power of computer science. Thank you. Thank you, Devika, wonderful. Our next speaker, Richard Batzel, Associate Professor of Marketing on Modeling Individual Choice Behavior. Good afternoon, thank you for coming. Thanks for the introduction, Susan. I need to begin by just saying flat out the main point I want to communicate in this talk, because I'm a little nervous it might not be obvious from the story I'm about to tell. So here it is. When one is modeling choice behavior, or modeling just about anything, the clarity and precision introduced by mathematics adds great value. Well, I will always remember the first time I read a paper by Amos Tversky. It was in 1974, and I was a first-year PhD student making copies of papers that I needed to read for a course in economic geography. That course made extensive use of choice models. The paper I'm referring to by Tversky was published in the Journal of Mathematical Psychology two years before, in 1972. And the truth is, I could follow the behavioral ideas, but not most of the math. It was very complicated. Now I need to step back and cover some background. The first general treatment of choice modeling using mathematics was in a small book by R. Duncan Luce in 1959. To make sure I'm clear about the importance of Luce to both psychology and economics, let me mention that the economist Daniel McFadden, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2000, specifically and generously recognized Luce's contribution to his own work with his acceptance speech in Sweden. In the work of Luce, 
credited by McFadden, Luce proposed an axiom on choice that led to a very powerful model. For example, in a nine alternative choice problem, the model could estimate 2,296 choice probabilities with only nine scales. But the parsimony of Luce comes at a price. One can think of perfectly reasonable patterns in choice probabilities that the Luce model could not capture. So, recognizing these limitations, Tversky proposed a new, considerably more complicated model, and the paper describing that model was where my story began. But it seemed to me that there had to be a simpler way to handle the problem. My dissertation was my first attempt to do so, but it was a failure. It did not fit actual data better than Luce. So I began my first full-time teaching job at the Wharton School of Business in Philadelphia with nothing to publish from my dissertation. My model's failure to fit better caused me to return to the drawing board and invest considerable time developing a better understanding of the loose axiom and model. And then, two years later, while driving on the New Jersey Turnpike, a new idea popped into my head. Loose had a scale for each object. I would simply add a scale for each pair of objects. This would better accommodate changes in probabilities across the sets. Right away, I took data I'd already collected and tested out the new idea, and it did fit significantly better. So I wrote this new idea up, applied it to three different sets of data from an experiment that I'd already conducted. I submitted it to the Journal of Marketing. But then came a very insightful review. One reviewer said, it was true my model was new, and the scales on the pairs of objects probably captured substitutability, but Luce had an axiom and a proof, and Tversky had a careful mathematical development, but I only had a new idea. This review came about the time we were moving to Texas so I could join the Rice faculty. But then a remarkable thing happened. Two of my MBA students working on a sports marketing project in my course in marketing research had used John Polkin in the mathematics department as a test subject in a choice exercise. While we were all drinking beer around the Friday afternoon keg outside of Herman Brown Hall, just back over there's a way, they introduced him to me. He said he found that choice exercise very interesting, and what he'd done, he'd actually recognized the orthogonal array structure behind the experiment. So I told him there was some important math behind that experiment, and he said he'd like to see it, so we arranged to meet the following week. When I got to his office on that Wednesday, I said, I will show you the math behind the experiment at some other time, but right now I have my own problem I want to show you. I showed him the loose axiom and the loose model that results, and then I showed him my model and said, what would be the corresponding axiom? Essentially, what's my axiom? He went to the board, we worked out a few things, and he said he'd think about it. Amazingly, two weeks later, he called me to his office and he said, Here's Luce's axiom and here's his model. Now here's your axiom and here's your model. But then he said, but here's another axiom and here's a third model. And look, your model is a special case of mine. We both then realized that if there were three levels in this hierarchy, there must be a general case solution. Six months later, we had it. A completely general model of choice and that paper was published in Marketing Science. In later collaboration with John, we also proved that Tversky's EBA model was a special case of our general model. We proved a simple way to estimate Tversky's EBA model, and we were the first to do so, and we actually found a mistake in Tversky's original paper that I'd been reading back in 74 when my story started. All along the way, the clarity and precision introduced by mathematics added great value to the modeling and research efforts. And now, please allow me a postscript. While on a year-long sabbatical for these past several months, I've been working with Michael Wolf in mathematics to extend some of the work with Polking, and we have made significant progress, but have not quite reached our goal, so there may be more to come. Thank you. It's always good to know that important things come from beer. All right, our next speaker is Laura Wildenthal, Associate Professor and Chair, History Department, speaking on gender. Thanks for coming out. What gender are you? What gender am I? Why do we care? I don't know exactly, but we do care. Gender as a category of analysis has spread so rapidly through the humanities and social sciences, in part, I think, because all of us have been doing gender all the time anyway, 
in our everyday lives. This is why the old Gender Studies 101 exercise of a gender diary works so well. You ask the students to keep a diary for a few days in which they note how their experiences and their treatment by others are linked to their gender and assumed sexual orientation. The exercise is especially vivid if the students go through the day imagining that they are of a different gender or sexual orientation than they are. I think of gender as a folk form of social theory. Everyone sees themselves as pretty good experts on sexual difference and its social manifestations. After all, all of us navigate it all the time. So we're all engaging in gender performance and analysis in our lives, usually without being conscious of it. When we do become conscious of it, we draw on our lifelong experience to explain what we see and feel. But this leads to a problem. Gender being a folk form of social theory may account for its enduring popular interest, but if it remains at the level of folk theorizing, then it's likely to remain an arena for recycling cliches. That's not much of a reason for intellectually curious people to be interested in gender, certainly not in academia, which is a place for getting away from cliches and the voyeuristic consumerism that promotes them. A second reason, then, why research on gender has spread so rapidly through academia is that it blasts through cliches and tells us really new things. Gender as a category of analysis generates infinite numbers of new questions. Here is one that was posed and discussed just last week by Stanford scholar Katrina Carcasis at a lecture sponsored by Rice's Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality. Why have athletics officials come to see testosterone blood level as the definitive marker of who is a man or woman? Even though some 25% of top male athletes appear to have below normal testosterone, even though blood level of testosterone does not reveal impact on the body, and even though there is no scientific consensus on how to demarcate any boundary between male and female humans. Like others who have taught gender studies classes, I note a special energy in those classrooms, and I think that special energy stems both from the folk sense of knowledge and from the excitement about learning something new. Students believe that they can jump right in and use gender as a social theory tool. At the same time, they quickly see that they are going to be surprised by learning some really new things. The, these new things hit us hard because we thought we already knew all about gender. When did gender history become important to me? In high school, I had a history teacher, Dr. Patty Puckett, who told us that our textbook did not have enough material on African Americans, Native Americans, and women, and so she would be supplementing it. As often happens when one first hears something important, I registered it, but I didn't take in its full significance. As an undergraduate at Rice, I took a course in US women's history offered by visiting Professor Sylvia Fry. I remember being much more impressed by the radical men and women about whom Alan Mattisow was teaching than by the dry accounts of the US women's suffrage movement we read in Dr. Fry's class. However, I do remember being very impressed with Dr. Fry herself. She was an example to me of a confident, exacting intellectual like Dr. Puckett back in high school and like my later graduate school mentor, Dr. Kathleen Canning. The example of those women historians who happened also to be historians of women certainly was an invitation and a challenge to me. However, let me distinguish that from my interest in gender history as it is possible for women students to be inspired by women mentors regardless of the subject matter of their research. Gender history came to matter to me during graduate school in the 1980s as I watched concept after concept get reworked when exposed to questions about gender. What was class? What was the public sphere? What was the family, the social contract, work? None of these concepts were left as they had been after exposed to gender analysis. Not only did women become vivid as historical actors, but also concepts and realms that were distant from women became intelligible in new ways. 
In my dissertation, I asked what happened when German women tried to join a male-dominated nationalist movement. In my teaching on human rights more recently, I explore how feminists have turned human rights norms and human rights movements upside down by asking what problems do women suffer rather than insisting on only protecting the classical, abstract-sounding, genderless norms such as freedom of speech. I'm interested in what drives human rights activists and how new human rights norms emerge, a story I could not tell if I ignored the formative power of gender. Has gender arrived in academia? I think so. My favorite indication is when colleagues and students tell me that they don't work on gender. Why would they say that if it hadn't arrived? Thank you. All right, wonderful. Okay, our last speaker today is Rick Wilson, Herbert S. Autry Professor of Political Science, The Beauty Premium and the Beauty Penalty. Thanks. I, I blame my parents. If I'd been made from better genetic material and ended up in the upper quintile of of attractive people, I would have made an additional $230,000 in my, over my lifetime. So being beautiful is worth it. Um, it pays in the job market. Men who uh, are in the upper quintile of attractiveness earn 14 to 17 percent higher than their unattractive counterparts. Women, as you might expect, make 75 percent less of that at the premium, but beauty nonetheless is rewarded. Um, for those of us who teach, uh, beauty is rewarded in, through higher class evaluations. Sadly, I took a look at my Rate My Professor uh, and confirmed what I already knew. My Rate My Professor uh, thing allows students to rate the hotness of their faculty, and I'm not. Uh, at least I can rationalize why I don't get better evaluations. Uh, the beauty premium extends to a lot of other domains as well. Attractive children are treated uh, better by parents and receive more attention. Uh, in schools, attractive defendants are given more lenient sentences, and attractive politicians are more likely to be elected. Now, the beauty premium is well known in the social sciences. Social psychologists understand this as part of stereotyping and, and attribution bias. Put simply, uh, we have expectations about beautiful people, and we attribute positive things to them. In other words, beauty is good, attractive people are thought to be more competent, more intelligent, more skilled, and possibly more trusting. Uh, there are strong evolutionary reasons that we, humans, uh, might be attentive to beauty. Uh, much of evolution is marked by the four Fs. Uh, as, as animals, we're wired to be attentive to others in our environment. And when encountering one another, we, we want to know whether we should fight, whether we should flee, whether we should feed, or whether we should uh, mate. And for this, uh, for this latter, choosing a partner may be really critical. And beauty is a reflection of good genes. Uh, and, may often be, and is often marked by symmetry, especially in the face. Beauty is also a signal of parental investment uh, through epigenetics. In short, beauty seems to be something that's desired in mating. Uh, but does beauty always yield a premium? Uh, my research indicates it sometimes leads to a penalty. My co-author Catherine Eckel and I have long been interested in social trust. Uh, trust involves putting yourself into someone else's hands and there, thereby putting yourself at risk. Trusting someone who's untrustworthy can be very expensive, economically, socially, and politically. While in many societies we have institutions that protect us from the untrustworthy, most of the time we rarely rely on those institutions. Um, trust has been called a social lubricant. Uh, it allows us to engage in hundreds of social interactions every day, uh, usually with people we don't know, and without invoking political institutions uh, to protect us. So it turns out that societies that uh, uh, have a good deal of social uh, trust, also have uh, higher economic performance and are less likely to engage in civil wars. So naturally, we decided that, that we wanted to see if beauty mediates trust. Well, how do you measure trust? You can ask people, but who's going to say they don't trust anybody? So we used a laboratory experiment. It's very simple and gets directly to the idea of, of trust. Suppose Susan McIntosh and I are playing uh, in the experiment along with a bunch of other people. We're both given $10. We're randomly matched, and one of us is randomly assigned to go first. Uh, so, for instance, Susan will have to decide how much of her $10 she wants to send to me. Whatever she sends is multiplied by three. Uh, 
and uh, I then have a second decision which I can send back some part of what I have. Suppose she sends me all $10. I now have $30, which was multiplied by the experimenter, and my own $10 for a total of $40. Well, what's Susan going to get back from me? <laughs> uh, what Susan sends to me, we measure as trust. What I return is, is measured as my trustworthiness. Well, back to beauty. We had pictures taken of all the subjects, and the subjects saw their counterpart. We then had the pictures rated for attractiveness. What did we find? Well, indeed, we found a beauty premium. Okay, people sent more to more beautiful people. No surprise here. People attributed uh, trustworthiness to the second movers and expected them to return more. But we also found a beauty penalty. We asked the second movers how much they'd send, uh, how, how much would be sent to them. We discovered two things. First, beautiful people do send more on average than not so beautiful people. But second, those beautiful people rarely match the expectations of the second mover. If Susan sends me $7, she dashes my expectations because I thought she'd send me 10. Okay, this leads me to send back less to her. Why? Well, beauty confounds intuition. By not meeting my unrealistic expectations, I punish her. So the beauty penalty kicks in, but only for the beautiful, not for those at the opposite end. Okay, so what's this mean? We're humans, we're susceptible to persistent cognitive biases. We can't help but be attracted to beauty. We imbue the beautiful with positive traits, and uh, when they're not met, we take it out on them, okay? Does this mean we should interview people with bags over their heads? Probably not, but uh, there are blind uh, auditions. They're common in music. At best, I think, as humans, we should be aware of the way in which beauty can confound our judgment. In the end, I still blame my parents. Thank you. Well, I want to thank Rick and all our speakers today for doing a wonderful job in keeping to time and developing interesting ideas within that very challenging small space of five minutes. And uh, thanks to Rick, I, I think I now understand the North Korea situation and Kim Jong-un a little bit better. <laughs> that trust factor is just not there. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming and uh, invite you to the reception that is over to my left. Uh, also, I would remind you that uh, in just, uh, let me see, today is Tuesday. I'm sorry, I just got back from Hawaii today, and so I'm a little bit unsure <laughs> what if I, is, did a new day pass? I was on the plane all night long. So to, uh, on the 11th, which would be a Thursday, right? Thank you. We're having uh, a Ciencia-sponsored small conference on space exploration and the human imagination. It promises to be outstanding, uh, and you've probably received notices about it, and it's advertised around campus, and you can find details, um, a link to the details on our website. And next year, I want to tell you that we have decided to continue with this five-minute format, but feature young faculty members um, rather exclusively because we have a lot of young faculty who are doing uh, phenomenal things. So that is the plan and I hope that we will see you next year. Thank you all for coming to this lecture and to all the other ones that you may have attended uh, this year and thank you again to our speakers. This program is protected by copyright and may not be redistributed in whole or in part without the express written consent of Rice University Digital Media Services.